Hello everyone, welcome to the chapter 8 lecture. In chapter 8 we will move beyond new material, new material to you, and start uh, incorporating things you've already learned in your MBA program into the course. We've already done that to some extent, but a lot of the material we've covered so far has been new to you in terms of the matrices and so forth. But now we're going to start looking at material that you've already had before, that you've had in other classes. And that's the point of a capstone course, is to use other materials that you have learned throughout your MBA program and help you incorporate them into one specific course, into a couple big projects, into a couple big case studies. And that's what we're going to start doing in Chapter 8. Uh, the first thing that Chapter 8 uh, covered is product positioning. Uh, what product positioning is, and yet this should look very familiar to all of you from your marketing class, is uh, finding a way to find a niche or a niche, whichever way you want to pronounce it, uh, to position your product in comparison to other products that are already out there. The book does a, a nice job here. I don't know how much I can improve upon what the book has already done. Uh, it, Basically, what you want to do is set up two, uh, set up a grid like they show you in the book, um, and you need to come up with two. Uh, what's the right way to put it? Um, criteria by which you will judge your industry. So, like one of the examples used in the book, the first one is for banks. So, they the two criteria they used were. Uh, personal versus impersonal was one criteria, and conservative versus aggressive was another criteria. Uh, the next example they use is for personal computers. High capability, low capability, good customer service, bad customer service. I probably would have used cost instead of uh, customer service, but once again, these are your choices on how to ca organize and categorize and how to set up the criteria for your particular uh, industry. Now, what you're and, and of course in the cohesion case, you're going to be doing this for McDonald's. And once you set up those the grid, you're going to place major competitors on that grid, and then you're going to figure out where you could position yourself uh, from a marketing standpoint and how to market uh, your company. So you're going to figure out how to market McDonald's in the cohesion case, which is kind of a fun project because it's it's a company we're all familiar with. So I think it's a good choice for this. Anyway, so I, I believe that this is a very healthy exercise. Hopefully it's something you did during, uh, during your marketing class, uh, or at least were exposed to it to some degree. It's not a difficult task, but it's a nice thought exercise, and it's something that every company does quite regularly, is see how they're positioning themselves versus how other companies are positioning themselves. And that's why you will see what from year to year, one year McDonald's will position themselves on their healthy options and then the next year you'll see them position themselves on customer service or their charity work and that's all in response to what the other fast food companies are doing in their marketing materials so maybe one year Burger King is has got a whole bunch of new food options well McDonald's will feel the need to respond and and start to adver advertising and market their own new food options so you, once you really start looking at product positioning, you will see it in everyday life quite frequently. The second thing you're going to be looking at is the EPS and the EBIT analysis along with financial statements. Now this really comes from your accounting and finance classes and to try to teach you how to do uh, pro forma financial statements in a lecture in week 10 of a strategy course is not probably appropriate uh, in terms of the volume of material. At this point in the class we're really leveraging what you've already learned previously in the program and, and I hope that you've done an earnings per share or something similar in previous classes along with the financial statements. If you have not this assignment is going to be quite overwhelming. Uh, please contact me uh, as soon as possible if you have not done these in previous courses uh, because we will probably need to come up with an alternative. I don't think it's realistic to have you learn how to do pro forma financial statements in, in a week just for this class. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to figure something out there but 
Um, I'm not going to go through in great detail how to do either of these. Uh, I believe that you will uh, um, that you will be able to recall what, how you've done it previously. The book does a nice job of walking you through and reminding you, but the book also takes into account that this is something you've already learned. So if it seems like the book doesn't get into enough detail, specifically on the financial statements, uh, that's that's on purpose. Uh, so uh, once again, if you if this is not something you've done before or it's not familiar at all, please let me know, and we'll and we'll figure something out. A piece of advice I will give in reference to the pro forma financials is not to make it more difficult than it is. You do not need to completely reinvent the financial statement uh, in doing this. You just need to adjust for the future. So if you believe revenue will go up by 10%, you simply take the last number you have, say for, a, I believe you have 2010, you need to update that to your projected 2011 number by adding 10% to the 2010 number, and then adjust the numbers below it accordingly. It's not too complicated, especially if you have it in spreadsheet form to work with it in Excel. It's not too bad. Uh, if this is something, even if, you, if you're familiar with it and it's still taking you um, 10 hours to complete, something's gone wrong. It really isn't that complex an exercise and it's one that students will often make much more difficult than it is. So like many of the other matrices, if you find them taking you too long, stop, review the materials, make sure you're doing it correctly, and if you have any questions, get in contact with me right away. Uh, finally, we're going to talk about net worth. Now, once again, having taught this class for so long, um, net worth is an area where students typically, once again, make things much more difficult than they are. Uh, the, the net worth analysis is quite straightforward. Uh, the book does an outstanding job of going over the different methods of calculating net worth. One of the things that throws students off is that the section on net worth is quite short. And that's because net worth isn't that complicated. So sometimes students will feel like the book is just flying by net worth and didn't give adequate examples and so forth. But it really isn't that difficult. And most of you, I believe all of you, have, have done something along net, the lines of net worth previously. Uh, the way that the book talks about it, and they have a nice table, table 814, on, uh, on net worth. And it even gives you the inform. This is one of the great improvements over previous editions. Is it tells you first the input data, the the information you're going to need to do the net worth analysis. That's that's new to this edition, and that's a nice thing to have. Now, on some companies, you're not going to have some of those numbers. Like goodwill and intangibles is not always there, uh, but you will be able to always find earnings per share, a number of shares outstanding, and stock price but you will need to go online to do that to find current numbers. That's not something you're probably going to find in a financial statement. Once in a while a book will throw something in like that, but for McDonald's you're going to need to go online and see what the current stock price is, the current earnings per share, and the current number of shares outstanding. Once again, I prefer Yahoo Finance, but you can use any financial website you'd like. It'll be there on any of them. A net income you get from uh, the income statement on the financial statements and shareholders equity is on the balance sheet and so you, you can find all of these numbers quite quite easily. Uh, total assets once again also in the financial statements forgot about that one. And then to do the net, the net worth analysis they use uh, four methods. The first one is simply shareholders equity uh, plus goodwill plus intangibles. Now if you don't have goodwill and intangibles you simply use uh, shareholders equity as the net worth. That's not overly common, uh, an overly common calculation for net worth, but it is certainly valid and, uh, and so you're going to want to do that. And the next one is net income times five as net worth. Now some companies, th th this is a, a very old traditional method of calculating net worth. This can throw you off th a little with some tech companies because they may not have any income. So what's if their net income is a negative number, ne you know, negative 10,000 times 5, the net worth is not really negative 50,000. So this one can be a little bit deceiving, especially on a young company, an upstart company, one where all of the earnings are out in the future. If you did a net worth analysis using net income times five on Amazon in 1999 or 98 um, you would have a net a negative number but now they're a very profitable company 
and obviously there was a lot of net worth there down the line. So uh, the idea and the concept of the company are worth something. So be careful with net income, but it's one you're gonna you're gonna have to use, and and uh, it'll definitely apply to McDonald's. Uh, the third one is stock price over earnings per share times net income. It's a very, fairly simple calculation. You look up the stock price, you look up the earnings per share, you do the division, then you multiply it by net income. It's, a, it's also a traditional method of calculating net income. It's, uh, um, it, it's, a, it's a solid method, it works well, and it's one that I don't think any of you will have problems with. Number four, number of shares outstanding times the stock price. This is the one that you will often see used to calculate somebody's net worth. Well, when you look on the Forbes list of the richest people in the world and you see Bill Gates, they're calculating his personal net worth based on the number of shares of Microsoft he has times the stock price. Uh, so this is often used for individuals where most of their worth is in, the st in a particular stock. And for companies, this is often... Uh, uh, this is the method often used to figure out the worth of the company. And so th this is a very popular method for publicly traded companies. Of course, it'll only work for publicly traded companies as will number three. If you're doing this on a company that's not publicly traded, these two just will not apply. So don't use them. Don't worry about them. Uh, but number four is, is a good one. And this is the one that you will probably for publicly traded companies is typically used uh, by itself. And it's a very simple calculation. Uh, number of shares outstanding times stock price. Get that stuff on, off the internet quite quickly. Sometimes they'll ar have already done the math for you. And then what this book likes to do is take a four method average. Now, taking a four method average only really works if all four methods work for that company. So I, I don't care about the four method average. Uh, and I don't care about the goodwill over total assets that don't worry about those two. What I'm really concerned about is, is one through four. And then to tell, tell me what that means. I mean, if the numbers, the numbers aren't going to be too similar in some cases, but if you've got a company with a no low net income for a year, they're still worth something. But if you use a four method average, number two net income times five is going to skew those results really low and be far beneath where the average is. Remember that the general population in the stock market really put the value at number four. That's how they're valuing the company. And so if the value at number four is $10 billion and number two is 100 million, the actual value is much closer to 10 billion than it is 100 million. So something to, uh, something to consider with net worth. Once again, these are fairly simple calculations. The information should be fairly simple to get. If you find yourself spending a lot of time, take a step back. Uh, and if, you, if the solution doesn't present itself to you, let me know and I'll be more than happy to walk you through. Uh, this, like I said before, this is an area where students will often get, get stuck and, and make things a little harder on themselves than they need to. So the two things to remember, uh, first, that not uh, all of these methods are accurate for every company. And the second, if it's not a publicly traded company, you can't do three and four. All right. Once again, as always, please contact me with any questions. Uh, we will not be doing a, a lecture for chapter nine. I think the chapter is fairly self-explanatory and we don't have any exercises on chapter nine. Uh, so uh, we'll uh, meet again for chapter 10.